media spoon feeds us propaganda from their masters. Is this? Then we have to deal with. Along with him comes. Some preachers like to put on a show and tell you that you might be left behind. But do the scriptures tell us certain people will have a way out of the great and terrible day of God's judgment? Or is it just a delusion? Let's find out next. first order of business on the subject of the rapture is that the word rapture is not in the Bible. It does, however, appear in the Vulgate, which is the Bible of the Roman Catholic Church in the form of the Latin word rapturo. The thought of a rapture comes from a verse in 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, and let's read verse 17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them and the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Let's take a look at this phrase, shall be caught up. In the Greek, this word is harpanzo. It means to be seized or to take something forcefully, like being snatched. The rapture was made popular by, but not originated by, John Darby back in the 1830s, through the means mostly attributed to some say demonic visions of a Scottish girl named Margaret MacDonald and her visions of Jesus returning to earth. But what did the scriptures actually say? The Bible states that Jesus spoke to his disciples after his crucifixion in Jerusalem. Then in Acts the first chapter, the scripture reads in verse nine, and when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Does this sound like there could be anything secret about this at all? We'll go into that here shortly. Now let's look at some of the proponents of the pre-trib rapture, such as John MacArthur, who justify there being two end time events with Jesus when we look at 1 Thessalonians 5 and read verse 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Right here, he is taking this verse way out of context. The passage is not talking about a secret rapture. Paul is telling the Thessalonians the same thing he told the Romans in chapter 9 and verse 22, in that they are not vessels of wrath that have been fitted to destruction. Look, I get it. No one wants to go through the great tribulation. It's a bitter pill to swallow, especially for baby sheep who have just come to the knowledge of the truth, but it doesn't mean you can just pick out a verse here and a verse there to fit your own agenda, which is what preachers like MacArthur are doing. They usually will pair this with Revelation, the third chapter, and verse 10, which reads, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the earth to try them that dwell upon the earth. MacArthur likes to say it's the elect that will be raptured before the tribulation. 
And free will preachers want to say that because you've accepted Jesus, you're going to be one of the ones who Jesus is talking about to in John the 14th chapter. Let's read verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. They like to say, see, this is what is waiting for you. You're not going to have to go through some tribulation because it's going to be a secret rapture. And they like to use 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. Let's read verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. They really like to explain it this way. And they'll say, see, it's all easy. You are not going to have to go through any tribulation. The Lord will come real quiet. And they will use 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 2 with this as well. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. They like to yank out a verse over here and yank out a verse over here to build their little house of cards, only they don't like it when you read the verses around them in context with them, or sometimes not even the whole verse at all. They try to stipulate that Revelation, the first chapter in verse 7, only applies to the second coming. So let's read that as well. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. They will also like to complete their little coup de grace with the scriptures and try to convince you that certain events have to happen before they, that takes place, and namely the man of sin and the tribulation, as they say is the last seven years of time, which we're going to get into here shortly. First, let's go back to 1 Thessalonians 4 and read verse 16 to keep it in context with verse 17. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. First off, this verse is giving us three witnesses as to when every eye shall see him from verse 7 of chapter 1 in the book of Revelation. Let's look at this word, shout. In the Greek, it is the word kelosma, and it means a call by a commander leading his troops into battle. Does that sound secret to you? This would be the archangel's voice, and a trump is called a voice in Revelation, the first and the fourth chapters. The second item in the verse is that who are the dead in Christ here? Let's go over to Romans 8 and read verse 10 to find out. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. To have Christ in you, you must be born again by the Holy Spirit, or you are not even allowed to see the kingdom of God. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Now, that word quicken in the Greek is zoopoieo, and it means to make alive spiritually. Even though the body is dead to sin, let's read what chapter 6 of Romans verse says about that. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Do you see how the scripture is saying the same thing over and over? We have a pattern here, and not just yanking a verse here and a verse there that adds up to nothing more than imagination. This takes us back to where they would have us to believe that Jesus comes back in secret. It's as if they're telling you that God is ashamed of himself. 
God is not that wimpy Jesus that calls someone down the aisle to accept him. In fact, we have to be accepted of him. When he does come back, he will have all the pomp and splendor and magnificence that he wants. Now let's look at uh, 1 Corinthians 15 and again read verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Let me ask you this. Why would God rapture out any unrepentant, putrid flesh that cannot hope to inherit the kingdom? He wouldn't. The mysteries of the kingdom of God are only given to the church who is the bride of Christ or the predestinated elect who give glory to God and not themselves. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. At the last trump, which every ear shall hear, and every eye shall see, when he splits the skies, just before Jesus passes judgment on this world. It's been brought to my attention that some folks don't think the last seven years on earth, or what is called the 70th week of the 70 weeks of Daniel, will be when the man of sin reigns on this earth, of which the last half of the seven years will be the great tribulation. I was accused in the last study of saying seven years of tribulation, and that is not true at all. Go back and review what I said. I specifically stated we will have to go through the great tribulation and the last seven years with the man of sin. Now let's go into where this is talked about in Daniel 70 weeks when we turn to the book of Daniel, chapter 9, and we can see how Daniel is praying to God and asking how long they are going to have to be in Babylon. So let's start reading in verse 21. Yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. Gabriel is the announcing angel, where Michael is probably the angel of the Lord that killed 185,000 men in one night in 2 Kings, the 19th chapter. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. Now Daniel is being given a vision from God through Gabriel. It's not like these jokers that tell you that I've got a word from the Lord, I've, or I've got a vision, I've had a vision from the Lord. What a joke. This is scripture. This is truth. This we can believe. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and the prophecy and to anoint the most holy. There are six items here listed, which I don't have time to get into specifically now. So you're getting a very short cliff note style version of this. When you look at this word weeks in the Hebrew, it is the word Shabuah, and it means weeks of years or seven years. God had told Moses back in Leviticus, the 25th chapter, that they could sow their fields and prune their vineyards for six years, but in the seventh year they had to let the land rest. If they did this in the sixth year, he would provide enough in that year to make it unto the start of the next seven years. He set the example of this in the wilderness with the manna. They gathered all they needed for six days. On the sixth day he gave them enough for two days in Exodus the 16th chapter. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. 
in Nehemiah, the second chapter, you can find where this decree was given to restore and build Jerusalem, which was around 444 BC. Gabriel also said the Messiah would come in seven weeks, three score, and two weeks. These weeks add up to 69 weeks, or 69 sets of sabbatical years. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. Notice how you have Messiah the prince, who shall be cut off, and the people of the prince. This is a different prince, as this one comes to destroy. The people of the prince that shall come was Rome. Vespasian was the general that destroyed the temple in 70 AD. This prince is continued in the next verse, but you have to remember that this is history. The Old Testament is the shadow of what is the very image in the New Testament. We have 69 weeks back in verse 25. The 69th week is when Jesus was here on the earth, but we still have one more week to go. You might be asking, what does all this have to do with the rapture or even the second coming? It has everything to do, especially with the timing. Now let's read verse 27. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. With this verse, automatically your thoughts should go from the history of verse 26 to prophecy because of the prophecy of what will happen in the 70th week or the last seven years of time. Notice how the scripture says in the midst of the week or the middle of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Then you see the abomination of desolation spoken of here, which Jesus refers to in Matthew 24 and Mark 13. You will not be allowed to carry your daily cross and worship God publicly then. All adoration will be required to be of the Antichrist himself. This is at the halfway point. Half of seven years is three and a half years. In Daniel 7, it is also called a time and times and the dividing of time, or as Revelation 12 says, a half time which is three and a half years. Seven years is 84 months. Half of that would be 42 months. So let's read about the man of sin and the beast in Revelation, the 13th chapter, and read verse 4. And they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. In the next verse, we see how he makes war against God. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given to him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. This will be when the one world government will be set up, which looks like it's right around the corner. It's not far off. You can see it now if you know what you are looking for. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain before the foundation of the world. Here we see God did not know the ones who worshiped the beast before the foundation of the world, obviously. This is where the doctrine of predestination and election comes in. Let's verify who the Lord knew and chose when we read Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. That word love in the Greek is agape. Now, 2 John 6 says this is love, that we walk after his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. It is his will. 
Jesus does this because our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of the world. He works all things after the counsel of his own will down there in verse 11. And it's going to happen the way God wants to because he is sovereign over everything going on. If you are of his elect, you praise his holy name and rest in what he is doing because all things work together for good to them that love God, who are the called according to his purpose over there in Romans the eighth chapter. Let's look at another example of the man of sin of the beast system back in Daniel 8 and start reading in verse 23. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the fool, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. The latter times is what we are heading into with breakneck speed right now. In the last study, we saw how the Bible called it the little season of Satan. Let's see if I can get up a link to that. These words, dark sentences, in the Hebrew are one word, which is the word kidah. And it means to be able to explain what seem to be enigmas or puzzles, or some might say parables. An example of this would be to fix the economy, as it looks like this whole world financial system could collapse at any time. We can't keep going like this. We are teetering ever so closely, even right now. World governments are being propped up like the United States for a reason. We are so far in debt, we will never get out of that, no matter what these politicians are saying. If you have any simple understanding of economics, you can see this. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully, and shall prosper, and practice, and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. He is going to sound so good and persuasive because he supposedly has all the answers. Really, he's just being seductive. He will seduce all the world in with all he has to say because probably the world will be in collapse. Sounds like what the spider said to the fly, doesn't it? And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. Through his own understanding, or his own wisdom, so he thinks, he shall cause craft to prosper. This word craft, here in the Hebrew, is called mirma, and it means deceit, or treachery almost like whoever is pulling Biden's strings right now. Uh, he's saying one thing, but the proof is in the pudding. He's doing another thing altogether. And don't think this is not of God, because it is. America is going down and has to fail to fulfill end-time prophecies, such as what is listed in Ezekiel the 38th and 39th chapters, when the king of the north will think to attack the land of Israel. Verse 25 also says, by peace he will destroy many. Do you know how he is going to be able to do this? The example is in Job the 15th chapter, where the scripture states, In prosperity the destroyer shall come upon him. And the context of that passage is talking about the wicked man. Now let's go back and look at another example of what has to happen before the second coming when we look at 2 Thessalonians, the second chapter, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus and by our gathering together unto him. Let's look at this word coming. In the Greek, it's the word parousia, and it means physical arrival. In this case, it's the physical arrival of our Lord Jesus with his second coming that ye be not shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. They thought that Christ would be back shortly at any time. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Let's look at these words, falling away. In the Greek, it's the word apostasia, 
and it means a forsaking or defection from the truth. In this case, it's rather obvious that this is happening right now. Then the man of sin or the Antichrist will be revealed. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. I'm very sure he is on the earth right now, walking around and working everything, or his people are working everything in the world the way they see fit for themselves. This again is of the Lord, as David said in Psalm 17, that wicked men, or men of this world, are the sword and the hand of God. Let's skip down to verse 8. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. In the first half of the seven years, these are the ones who will worship the beast and take his mark. In Revelation, the 13th chapter, the scripture says that he will make fire come down from heaven in the sight of men. But the ones that will follow him will do this because Satan does his job very well, which he was designed for according to Revelation, the 12th chapter. He says he will deceive the whole world. This also is by God's design. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Right now, most of those that call themselves Christians participate in Xmas, or what is called Christmas, as well as Ishtar, which is Easter. The Bible condemns both of these as abominations. Could the abomination of desolation be an Xmas tree? It definitely fits the bill. Now let's go to Matthew 24, where we read a little bit of this in the last study. The disciples asked Jesus, what are the signs of his coming in verse 3? So let's skip down to verse 5. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, and pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Every one of these churches out here tout their Jesus, but that Jesus is the one Paul calls another Jesus another spirit, and another doctrine in 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, where Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Then shall they deliver you to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Luke 6.22 says you are blessed when you are hated for the Son of Man's sake, not for money. They hate you because God has chosen you to be a vessel of mercy to the world, by your, what comes out of your mouth when you take up your daily cross and witness to them about self-denial, about the fear of the Lord, about the grace and mercy he has shown you by allowing you the gift of repentance. He came not to call the self-righteous, but sinners to repentance. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another and many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure until the end, the same shall be saved. Right here is the evidence that you do not get saved by an altar call and accepting their Jesus. This is an out and out lie. Those that preach this are the false prophets that we just read in verse 11. You may have some preachers that even say predestination out of one side of their mouth, but they put their approval on X mass on the other. These are the most subtle, kind of like their father Satan. These probably look good in their suits and their ties with their mega churches. There's even one saying America will fall or must fall right now. He looks 
and sounds like he knows what he's talking about with his good word and fair speeches. Yet, he also has his flattering title in front of his name. This is how they lead the many through the wide gate of destruction over there in Matthew, the seventh chapter. The seduction of this world is so desirable, but all that is in the world is not of the Father, according to 1 John, the second chapter. Now let's read verse 27. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. When Jesus splits the skies, every eye shall see him, as Revelation, the first chapter in verse 7 stated. Let's look at the time frame of this in verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Did you see and hear that? He is only gathering his elect, his called his chosen before the foundation of the world. Daniel 7 and Revelation, the fifth chapter, describe the numbers of these angels as 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Jesus will be at the head of all these angels with his eyes as a flame of fire because many of his church, his wife, his bride, of verse 9, says that they will be afflicted and killed. Now let's go back and read 1 Thessalonians 4 and 16 again with all the other scriptures in context properly. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now you see who it is that will be going to meet the Lord in the air and when. It is only those elect who are still alive and have survived the slaughter in the great tribulation. These are the ones that will be snatched away. If you are like me, you just hope and pray to be able to see his face and to hear these words. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have kept my words. You have fought the good fight. Now stand back and watch what I do to my enemies who would not have me to reign over them.